In this section of the respiratory system chapter, we're going to consider the structures of the respiratory tract. Remember the brackets around ventilation and external respiration and the list of respiratory functions. Those are the ones that take place in these structures. The book presents the structures of the respiratory system in terms of the conductive zone and the respiratory zone. And I just want to concentrate on conduction, the moving of air in and out of the lungs, and I'll include the structure of the respiratory zone at the end of everything. The respiratory tract can be thought of as having two regions, the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. Many sources will just simply make the dividing line between the head and neck versus the thoracic cavity. But more importantly, what defines upper versus lower respiratory tract is what keeps the airway open. Now the airways have to stay open so that we have a constant supply of oxygen. The upper respiratory pathway, which is the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, and the pharynx, all stay open because they're part of the bony structure of the head and neck, namely the, the skull and along the length of the cervical region of the vertebral column. The lower respiratory tract, which is made up of the larynx, pharynx, bronchi, and bronchioles going down into the lungs, are all kept open through cartilage in the walls of those structures giving them some flexibility as the body moves around, but still staying open so that air is always flowing in and out. I want to run through some special aspects of the respiratory tract. To begin with, this micrograph shows us a pseudostratified epithelium, which is what we find lining the respiratory tract. Now, it doesn't actually line the entire respiratory tract. There's an area where the respiratory tract and the digestive tract overlap, namely the oral cavity and the inferior two-thirds of the pharynx. And in those locations, the digestive tract lining is more important because it's much more protective against the things that might be ingested. Besides there, we find the pseudostratified epithelium in the nasal cavity, the nasopharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and into the bronchioles. And then eventually, probably at the level of bronchioles, that pseudostratified epithelium gently transitions down to a simple squamous epithelium, which is what lines the alveoli. This figure lays out the names for many of the structures in the upper respiratory tract, as well as starting into the lower respiratory tract. What I want to point out here is really focusing on the nasal cavity, where we tend to inhale air to begin with. An important function of the nasal cavity is to warm up the air and hydrate it. Now, the air that we breathe in is going to be colder and drier than the insides of our body. And so the nasal epithelium helps with this by both secreting a mucus, which will provide water that will evaporate into the air as we breathe it in, as well as having a major supply of blood vessels, which will warm up the air as it passes through. There are three bony folds in the wall of the nasal cavity called the superior, inferior, and middle nasal conchi. They're acting like turbines as we inhale air. So when you take a deep breath in, like that, what you hear there is really the air kind of spinning through the turbine action of the nasal epithelium through the nasal cavity, where it's slowed down enough to be hydrated and heated up before it goes down into our body. To illustrate where the digestive tract overlaps with the respiratory tract, we can consider that the pharynx, or the throat, is separated in three different regions. There's the nasopharynx, represented in a green, light green here, next to the nasal cavity. There's the oropharynx, in a bluish green here, next to the oral cavity. And the laryngopharynx, in a purple, next to the larynx. The oropharynx and the laryngopharynx are both part of the digestive tract, so they have to be lined with the digestive epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium, instead of the respiratory epithelium, a pseudostratified epithelium. The larynx is the beginning of the lower respiratory tract. Another way of thinking of how to define the lower respiratory tract is when we swallow, a 
flap of tissue called the epiglottis folds down over the lower respiratory tract and it keeps food or whatever we're swallowing from going down the so-called wrong tube. The cartilage that defines the lower respiratory tract is in evidence here. The major cartilage that we see is called the thyroid cartilage, which makes up the anterior and lateral sides of the larynx. There's an opening towards the back where there's mostly soft tissue, so there's not cartilage there. But um, at the base of the larynx is a ring of cartilage called the cricoid cartilage. And sitting on top of that is the arytenoid cartilage, which pivots back and forth, opening and closing the vocal cords. This drawing represents a laryngoscopic view. You can use a fiber optic type camera to look down into the larynx, which is often used during intubation to make sure that the breathing tube that's being inserted goes between the vocal cords. This image is anterior face down. The tongue would be anterior to all of this. The vocal cords are painted white here because as a tissue they usually appear quite white. They don't have a blood supply going to them in any great amount because it's mostly dense regular connective tissue. The glottis is the space across the vocal cords including the gap in between and for speech we move the vocal cords back and forth in order to produce speech sounds by varying the pitch created by vibrations of the vocal cords when air is pushed across them. Next I'm going to show you a YouTube video with a laryngoscope going while a woman is producing speech sounds, both speaking and singing. Pay attention especially to the openings that occur every so often as she takes a deep breath. And you can see the pivoting of the arytenoid cartilage covered by epithelial and other soft tissues as the vocal cords briefly open up the glottis as wide as possible to get as much air in during that breath. The lower respiratory tract then continues down through the trachea, which branches into the bronchi and into smaller and smaller tubes, eventually the bronchioles. The trachea is ringed by cartilage that goes around most of it except for the posterior region where it's adjacent to the esophagus. And there is a smooth muscle called the tracheallus that when it spasms, momentarily pulls the tracheal cartilage in, increasing the pressure in the trachea and forcing whatever might be obstructing the trachea out. This spasm is a type of cough, a, a simple cough, like a <laughs> kind of cough. Branching off the trachea, we have the primary bronchi, which one goes to either lung. And then within the lung, the primary bronchi branch into secondary bronchi, one going to each lobe, three to the three lobes on the right lung and two to the two lobes on the left lung. Then branching off of that, not labeled in this picture, are the segmental bronchi or the tertiary third level, what do you want to call it, bronchi, that go to each of the different segments within the lung. And then branching off of that are a series of smaller and smaller bronchi called interlobular bronchi that eventually give rise to the microscopic tubules called bronchioles that eventually finish out the bronchial tree, ending at the terminal bronchiole that give rise to the respiratory structures. Which brings us to the end of the airway, the respiratory zone. The terminal bronchiole is technically not the last bronchiole. It's the last bronchiole of the 
conduction zone, but it gives rise to the respiratory bronchioles, which are different because gas exchange can take a pl place across their walls, and they have attached to them all the alveoli. Uh, branches off the respiratory bronchiole are called alveolar ducts, which sort of have alveoli clustered around them, and then the alveoli are surrounded by pulmonary capillaries. The walls of the alveoli are made up by two different types of cells, called type 1 and type 2 alveolar cells. The type 1 alveolar cells are the simple squamous epithelial cells. Type 2 alveolar cells are specialized to secrete a substance called surfactant. Surfactant is a very watery substance, and its job is to help keep the alveoli open based on the same surface tension properties of a soap bubble. There are also macrophages that roam through the alveoli, helping to clear out any small cellular debris or dust or pollen that might have gotten down that far, as well as clearing away pathogens that can make it to that level. The capillaries that surround the outside of the alveoli, we can see several around this particular one in the drawing, are where the internal, excuse me, is where the external respiration takes place. Across the respiratory membrane, which is where the simple squamous epithelium of the alveoli meets up with the simple squamous epithelium of the capillary, gases move across that. Consider this question when you feel that you've reached an answer. Hit the next button to go into the next slide, which will reveal the correct answer. The definition of the lower respiratory tract really is those regions that are kept open because of cartilage in their walls. 